I think we all ought to learn about brain science. We all ought to learn about the theory about what's going on in our head as we look out at the part of the world and we learn the world, we learn this model of the world and how our world model can be false. To me, this is like basic knowledge that we should all have just like basic knowledge about DNA or about the solar system and the universe. And I think when we finally have a very cohesive theory, which we're very close to here, I think we've made a lot of progress, that should be taught to every kid in high school. And if we all understood how we can make false beliefs and how we, and how we could be biased in what we understand about the world, I think it would make our future a bit rosier. Welcome to Brain Science, the podcast where we explore how discoveries in neuroscience are helping unravel the mystery of how our brain makes us human. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell, and this is episode 183. If you're curious about how your brain really works, this is the podcast for you. This month's episode is an interview with Jeff Hawkins about his new book, A Thousand Brains, A New Theory of Intelligence. For those of you who are new to brain science, I want to mention that Hawkins' first book on intelligence was featured way back in episode two, and this is actually the third time that we have talked. Unlike many of my guests who are driven by the question of how the brain generates consciousness, Hawkins wants to create a theory about how the cortex generates intelligence. As he noted in the excerpt you just heard, this is actually a very critical question that could influence humanity's future. Before we jump into the interview, I want to remind you that you can find complete show notes and episode transcripts at brainsciencepodcast.com. Brain Science is produced independently and relies on the financial support of listeners like you. To learn more, please visit brainsciencepodcast.com forward slash donations. You can send me feedback at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. And we also have a Brain Science Podcast fan page on Facebook. If you'd like to get show notes automatically, sign up for our newsletter. It's free, and you can get there by just texting the word brain science, all one word, to 55 Four four four. That's brain science, all one word, to 55444. You'll also find links to this in the show notes on the website. I'll be back after the interview to review the key ideas and to tell you how you can help me improve the brain science website. So Jeff Hawkins, it's great to have you back on brain science. It's great to be back, Ginger. I always enjoy talking to you. I didn't realize it had been over three years since we last talked. When I got your new book, I was thinking, didn't we talk after that 2019 paper? And then I realized, no, we haven't talked since 2017. But at any rate, I hope I have a few new listeners since then. So would you just start out by just maybe telling my listeners a little bit about your unique journey as a neuroscientist? Yeah, so I fell in love with studying the brain right when I was finishing up college and I was studying electrical engineering. And I decided to change career paths and say, well, instead of being an electrical engineer, I want to be a theoretical neuroscientist. I want to understand how the brain works. And so I've been trying, I have been pursuing that ever since. It it took me a while to make the full transition. And, and along the way, I, I had a career in technology. I started a couple of um, handheld computing companies, Palm and Handspring. But all the time, I was trying to get back into neuroscience. And I won't go through all the details of that history. But about 20 years ago, I was able to make the transition full time. So I've now been doing full time neuroscience research for the past 20 years. And first, I was doing that by running, I created and ran the Redwood Neuroscience Institute, which is it's just now it. Uh, UC Berkeley, and still going strong there. And for the last, I forget now exactly, maybe 17 years or so, I've run an independent research group at a company called Nementa. And our focus is really uh, sort of understanding at a theoretical and detailed biological level how the neocortex works, and also taking what we've learned and applying it to practical problems in machine learning, but mostly on the neuroscience side. So since I, I just have a sort of practical question, you are in a very unusual position in that your company doesn't rely on any kind of grants or anything for your research. Do you fund your research with the software that you 
developed that I know I've I've had listeners who were really into that software in the past. Um, Is that how yeah. you fund your research? No, no, it's not. Uh, all right. So a little bit more of the story. <laughs> I'm just curious. So I actually became a graduate student in, I think it was 1980 at UC Berkeley. I had quit the computer industry and I said, okay, I'm going to become a full-time into this. And I, I wrote a thesis proposal for the graduate manner and the graduate group in neurobiology. And then I talked about how I wanted to study the neocortex and the different approaches I wanted to take. And he said, this is really great. You ought to do this, but you can't. <laughs> I said, why can't I do this? And he goes, there's a lot of reasons. He says, first of all, no one else is doing this kind of work and you won't be able to get funded for it. Everybody thinks it's too speculative. Although he said, I agree with you. This is what we ought to be working on. And you have good ideas. You won't be able to do it. And that, I was so taken back by that. I was like, oh my goodness, I'm not just up against a, an interesting scientific problem, but there's an institutional problem here too. And the more and more I talked to different neuroscientists and to talk to the funding agencies, I got to understand that at least back in that time, which was in the 1980s and, uh, and 1990s, you couldn't get funding to do theoretical work in neuroscience. It just was impossible. And so I decided that I'd have to take a different approach. And so I went back into the computer industry to do a couple of things. One is to mature and, and put some food on the table, <laughs> but also with the idea that I'd get myself in a position where I could pursue the research that I wanted to do. And that included financially. We have investors in Dementa. We have outside funding. We have, invest, we have a venture investor in the company. But a lot of the funding comes from myself and some of the other principals involved. So we're, you're right. We're in a very unique position in how we go about it. And numerous neuroscientists have told me that they wish they were in a similar position because we can pursue the research we want to pursue independent of what is fashionable in, in terms of grants at the moment. So uh, I appreciate that that's an unusual position. Because so many of the older scientists that I've talked to have said that what they had to do was make their name in something acceptable first before they could explore the question they really wanted to explore. And that seems an inefficient... It was an inefficient road for me, too. In some sense, I did the same thing. I just made my, I made my name in technology. And I made, I, I'm fortunate that I was successful and I was able to get the financial resources to do what I want to do. So yes, it's, it is weird. It's so strange. I mentioned this in my new book, this, this story about this, because here I was like, okay, I'm going to go do this. I'm really going to dedicate my life to studying the brain. Everyone thinks that figuring out how the brain works is the most important thing to do, but you weren't allowed to be a theoretician. You weren't allowed to really tackle it from a theoretical point of view. In physics, we have theorists and we have experimentalists. But there, were, there wasn't that division in, in neuroscience. There were really only experimentalists, and any theory was looked down upon. Uh, it's a strange uh, thing, but it really is true. It's changed very recently, but back in that day, that was the way it was. This isn't fascinating, but I know we want to talk about your new book. In your first book, you proposed that the primary function of the cortex is to make predictions. And I'm assuming that wasn't totally original to you, but you did make the idea accessible to non-scientists. And since then, it's become pretty mainstream. But now in your new book, you're proposing a new theory that really focuses on the cortical columns. Could you talk? I know you want to give a big view of your book, but and if you want to start there, that's fine. But I like the historical perspective you gave in the book of why you were drawn to the idea of the cortical column and Vernon Montcastle's work. I like putting that into that perspective. I became aware of Vernon Mountcastle, who was a neurophysiologist at Johns Hopkins. And I became aware of his work early on. He, and he wrote in 1979, he wrote this monograph, a 50-page essay, in which he made this profound or very surprising suggestion or claim. And that is that the neocortex, which is 70% uh, of a human's brain's volume, it's the biggest part of our brain, and there's this big sheet of cells that's responsible for vision and hearing and touch and language and, and so on. He said, even though it does all these different things, I think it all works on the same principle. And that if you look at the details of the anatomy and the physiology of the neocortex, it looks like it's divided into lots of these little columns that are all doing basically the same thing. And, and if, you, if you assume a column is for, we, it varies in size, but if we say about a millimeter square, there'd be about 150,000 of them in the human brain. And he said, well, you know what? This neocortex is just a sheet of these things. It's all these columns stacked side by side, huge numbers of them, and they're all doing the same thing. And therefore vision and hearing and touch and language are somehow actually the same problem. 
And this seems so counterintuitive from a, just a sort of a logical point of view that uh, many people just had trouble believing, but the evidence from a, anatomy and physiology is overwhelming. And so this became to me, that clearly, if you want to understand the human brain, then you got to understand the neocortex, which is the biggest part of the human brain, the most important part, most associated with intelligence. And to understand the neocortex, you have to understand what a cortical column does. And so from the, from the very beginning, I had been focused on how do we tackle this idea? What could a column be doing? And in my in, in the way I decided to attack this was to focus on something I knew that it did. I knew that the cortical column or the neocortex in, in general, but the neocortical column in particular, had to make predictions about the world. It had to predict what its inputs were going to be. And so that became the focus of how we organize our research, asking the question, multiple questions about how could a, a group of neurons that comprise a cortical column, maybe 100,000 neurons, how do they make predictions? And under, under what conditions do they make predictions? What does it mean physically for neurons to make predictions? And so that has been the common theme. What's changed in recently is we asked, how does the brain make predictions when we move? So every time you move your finger or move your eyes or walk forward or anything, you move any part of your body or your sensory organs, the brain is predicting what it's going to sense. And how could that be? And, and we had a real couple, two big breakthroughs in understanding that. These occurred, um, uh, I'm trying to think exactly what year those occurred, but I think back in 2017, maybe. And so the new book is about those discoveries, which were really opened up everything for us. But it's still under that same theme about how does the brain make predictions? It's not that the brain, that's the only thing the brain does. In fact, in the book I described, that's not what the brain does. That's one of the things that's resulting from what it does. But it was a good way of attacking the problem. I was asking the question, well, how does the brain make predictions? And so all of our papers have been related to that. One thing I want to come back to, but I'm just going to give you a heads up so that you can be thinking about it and we can come back to it, is when we talked in 2017, as I was looking back at the transcript, our focus was on your 2016 paper that really had to do with, at the neuronal level, how an individual neuron could do prediction based on, on the fact that the dendrites could neuromodulate its signal. And I'd like to, and you don't really directly talk about that in your new book. So if we have time, I'd like to come back to that and tie it back into how this relates to the new stuff. But first, why don't you just give us an overview of where your theory stands now based on the recent discoveries? Yeah. So we talked about how the brain makes predictions, and I wrote a book about that, and it's become pretty mainstream. But I have a new way of thinking about that and just a new language, and I should say, actually to describe what's going on. The way to think about the neocortex is it learns a model of the world, where things are, what they look like, what they feel like, how things behave. Your brain has a model of this and, and the neocortex stores knowledge as part of this no model. So the model tells us we can imagine what things will look like in a different direction. We can imagine what things will happen when we activate it. And so there's some sort of internal structure to the neocortex which represents the structure of the world. And the new theory is we focus on how that model is learned through movement, like when we move our body, and how the model allows us to predict inputs as we move about in the world. We move our fingers, we move our eyes, and we're constantly moving, and the inputs to the brain are constantly changing, yet we're constantly predicting what's going to happen next. So we had two sort of key components of this discovery. The first is that the neocortex, as we talked about earlier, is built up these cortical columns. And we realized that each cortical column is a complete modeling system. Each cortical column on its own gets sensory inputs and generates motor output and can learn the structure of whatever it's looking at. If it's a part of the visual system, we'd be looking at input from the retina. If it's part of the somatosensory system, we'd be getting input from the skin. But each of these thousands and thousands of columns is a complete modeling system. And the second thing was we, we discovered that the key to how the modeling system works in each of these columns. In the book, I use the word reference frames and I talk about what they are and how that, how that allows structure, storing the structure of the world. But I also talk about how we believe what's going on in the cortex is the actual neurons are building these reference frames that store knowledge are the same idea, the same basic mechanisms that's going on in an older part of the brain. Uh, many of your listeners will be familiar with grid cells and place cells in the hippocampal complex. And that's an area that's been very heavily studied over the last few decades. We think the same basic mechanism that something like grid cells are operating in the neocortex. And when they are providing this reference frame, 
And a viewer or a listener could think of a reference frame as like a, a Cartesian coordinates, like an X, Y, Z coordinate system, where you have the ability to store information at various locations. You can say, this thing is at this location relative to that, and this is at this location relative to that. And so we literally build up in our brains, each cortical column learns the structure of something or many things using reference frames. It's like little CAD programs, computer aided design programs in, in essence. Those two things, the fact that there was thousands and thousands and thousands of models going on simultaneously, and in each of those is built using reference frames, using these mechanisms that were evolved a long time ago in an older part of the brain called, uh, that we call grid cells and, and play cells. There's something equivalent going on in the neocortex. And so that with that, that whole picture, the whole, uh, how we understand the world and, and how we move about in the world and how our bodies interact with the world came into place. It was a, a big leap forward in our thinking. I think it might be helpful if you take us back to how the hippocampus does what it does so that it'll be easier for listeners to leap to what you're saying that the cortical columns do. Yeah, I think that's a great way of going about it. In fact, that's how we did it, too. Here's a way to think about it. The, the hippocampal complex has got a number of different parts of the brain. The, these are all very in the center of your brain. They're like they're maybe like the shape of the size of a, a small egg. You have two of them. On each side. And there's things called the hippocampus and the anterior cortex, and there's other brain regions that are all, these are all tightly packed in the center of your brain. And starting in, I believe it was 1990 to today, there's, the, people started discovering these remarkable cell properties in the hippocampal complex. And one of them was the first ones to discover were called place cells, and then there's things called uh, grid cells. What they discovered that is these cells allow an animal, uh, they first discovered these in rats, but we know they exist in all mammals now, at least as far as we know. They allow an animal to learn a map of its environment. So if I'm in my house right now and I know where I am, just the fact that I know where I am, there's neurons that know where I am, those neurons are in the hippocampal complex. The place cells and the grid cells are a way of mapping out your space that you're in and as you move about, they update their activity to reflect where you are. It's all like they build a map of your world. And this map is, in these, is implemented by these grid cells and place cells. And they allow you to know where things are and how to plan to get from one location to the other. So these have been studied quite heavily. They work on very clever mechanisms and surprising mechanisms. It's not completely understood yet, but we've learned, the world has learned a lot about how these cells work. What we realize that is that when you learn a map of your environment, whether it's your backyard or your town or your, your house, that's very similar to how we learn something like what a coffee cup is. And in some sense, if I think about myself moving around in my house, it's very equivalent to me moving my finger over a coffee cup or, or even if I'm looking at the coffee cup, attending the different locations on the coffee cup. It's the same mechanism that the older parts of the brain use to learn maps over your space and your environment as you move through it, We've been now understand or we've, uh, that the cortex is doing the same thing for each part of your sensory organ. So each of your fingers are like five people wandering over this coffee cup that's in my hand right now. And each one is building a map of the coffee cup in the same way that you build a map of your backyard or your house. And so it's a general purpose mechanism that was taken from the old parts of the brain and reused in the neocortex to start learning the structure of other things besides your environments, whether it's your computer or coffee cups. And in the book, I go into even further. I say it can go beyond physical things. The cortex can learn the structure of politics or mathematics or language. This gets back to Mountcastle's common cortical algorithm. The idea that the neocortex is learning models of the world based on movement and reference frames applies to everything we know, all our knowledge. And so it opened up a whole new way of thinking about how the neocortex works. <laughs> I want to take a moment to share this month's sponsor, Text Expander. This is an app I use all day long because it allows me to avoid repetitive typing. I can constantly update my list of snippets and then expand them to whatever I need. It saves me time and helps me avoid typos. And it's easy to use. And since it's available on Mac, Windows, Chrome, iPhone, and iPad, I can use it everywhere. There are also great tools for teams. You can get 20% off your first year of Text Expander if you sign up at textexpander.com forward slash podcast. That's textexpander.com forward slash podcast. Please don't forget to tell them that you heard about it on Brain Science. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so when you use the term reference frames, would it be accurate for me to say, okay, when I'm looking at the hippocampus and the surrounding regions, everything is referenced to the animal. But when we're looking at things in the cortex, it's in reference to its the objects or whatever we're modeling? Not quite. So here's the clever thing about it. The grid cells and the play cells learn a model of the environment. And it's referenced in the reference frame of the environment. So my the room I'm in right now, my living room, I have chairs and a sofa and tables and lamps and things like that. This model of where they are, but the model is relative to where each other. They're not, and so that model exists independent where I am. That's the clever thing they do. They build this model of the world using a reference frame that's relative to the room, not to me. I have also reference frames around my body. It turns out there are parts of the neocortex model my body. And therefore I have reference frames for my body, but the model of my world is independent of where I am in it. And this is why I can enter a room that I've been, I've been in before, but I can enter from a new direction or stand in a new location. I'm not confused because the model is relative to the room. And same thing is going on the cortex. It's relative to the objects in the world. So what kind of evidence do we have so far to support this insight? So uh, we derive these ideas primarily by looking at existing empirical data and uh, matching them up with theoretical constraints. When we first came up with this idea about reference frames, that was purely from a, a deduction. We were thinking, okay, the cortex has to make predictions about what it's going to sense as we're moving about in the world. And I described this in the book. I described the, the literal thought experiment I went through to, to say, oh my gosh, there has to be reference frames. But then we didn't know how that could be. We said, well, how could neurons do this? It seems almost impossible. And so we were very hesitant to talk about it too much because it seemed like we had no idea how it could come about. And so then we were thinking about it for a while. And then we said, oh, wow, look, these, there are these reference frames in the entorhinal cortex in the hippocampus. And maybe, as I suggested, that it's using the same mechanism. But we had no evidence of that at the time that the neocortex would use the same mechanism as the entorhinal cortex in the hippocampus. But then we said, okay, well, it seems too good to be to not talk about. So we, we, we wrote our first paper about it. But then we learned that there actually was new empirical evidence we hadn't known about where people are discovering the existence of grid cells in the neocortex. Now, this is, they were discovering in the prefrontal areas of the neocortex, but our argument is that it's going to be everywhere in the neocortex because every cortical column is doing basically the same thing. And so now there's evidence that there's growing evidence more and more that's, that there are grid cells and, and play cell equivalents in various parts of the neocortex. And so that empirical evidence is growing. I don't think yet there's any empirical evidence for it being in the, the primary and secondary sensory regions as we predict, but I'm very confident that that will be found. So this is a typical thing that a theorist do, right? We come up with ideas based on both deduction and known empirical evidence. And we make speculative proposals, and then hopefully those get tested. And in this case, we didn't test it. Other people are doing the research, which sort of validates what we've been what And we've we should need so, something as expensive as the Large Hadron Collider to test this. <laughs> no, no. In fact, the researchers who did this were very clever. They, they used fMRI technology to deduce the presence of grid cells in the prefrontal cortex. And they did, they did it in a very clever way. It was complicated, so I, I'm not going to go through all the details here. But, unless you want to. But so it, it was using existing uh, experimental setups. It was literally, you could just take a human and ask them to do some things inside of an fMRI imaging machine. And through clever experimental analysis, they were able to figure out that, yes, there's grid cells there. <laughs> and the other interesting thing you talk about in the book is how you can take, because we have all this data that's been collected over the years without theory, how you can go back and, and look at experiments that were already done, looking for what you need to find. Or validate. It, we can invalidate. We've done that lots of times and in, in invalidate our theories. We have an idea and we say, well, this idea makes this prediction. And, and sure enough, you go back into the literature and you find people may have even decades ago reported on things, but no one knew what to make of it at the time. So you can go back and look at the earlier research. That sometimes it's almost forgotten. And you can find research that's relevant. We do that all the time. And it's, there's so much published data out there on the brain. Just incredible number of papers that no one can possibly keep it all in their head. And so if you need to find something, you can often dig down and find it. Not always, but often. 
What about the current hierarchical models of cortical function? How does your theory relate to those? It cha- definitely changes the way I think about hierarchy. And the classic hierarchical view that's held by neuroscientists and by machine learning and AI people is that you have information comes from some sort of sensory array and you the first stage in processing, you extract some features from it, like in a visual image, you might extract lines and edges and things like that. And then you process it in another layer of, of a processing where you extract more complex features and another one, you have more complex features. And eventually after so many layers of doing this, you end up with representations of a complete object. That I think is wrong. It's not completely wrong, but it's largely wrong. There still is a hierarchy of processing, but we now know that every stage of the processing step, every part, and think about neocortex, every region of the neocortex, even the primary region of vision or the primary region of of touch or hearing, these are building complete models. They are not just extracting small features. They are processing sensory input and movement of the sensor so that the, these regions know how the sensor is moving. And they can, using these reference frames, they can build up models of the things they're observing. So even a single cortical region can learn complete models of sensory input. And, and there's lots of evidence now supporting this idea. But we still have a hierarchy. So what's going on in the hierarchy? Well, we don't really know. And I make this point in the book, but my, but my best guess is that we instead of passing features and then more complex features and then even more complex features, if each region of the cortex is learning complete models of something, then you're passing what you're passing to the next region is in some sense a representation of objects, not representation of features. So you could build up a hierarchy of objects as opposed to features. There's still a hierarchy there, but it changes it completely. If you think about the, the mouse, actually has a, a decent vision system. People don't realize that, but a mouse can can do some surprising things in vision. And it, its vision system com- is composed of primarily just one visual region. It, it doesn't have much of a hierarchy at all. It has basically one V1 and has a couple teeny other little things next to it. But, and it, can, it is surprisingly good vision on certain tasks. And so it, it just shows you don't need this complex hierarchy to have a visual understanding of the world. But if you want to have a very deep understanding of the complexity of the structure of objects composed of other objects, composed of other objects, then you probably still need a court of a hierarchy. Yeah, I always thought the problem with the hierarchical model was that it really didn't explain any of the feed forward. I mean, why would why would the upper areas be sending stuff down to the lower areas? That never makes any does to me make any sense under a hierarchy. That's a whole other <laughs> we can talk about that forever, yeah. but yeah. Jeff, what are the problems that this theory solves that older theories like hierarchical ones can't address? Well, again, I would say this theory is not a, a counter to hierarchical models. It's basically what it introduces, which hasn't been part of a previous models. It introduces the critical role of behavior that you know, most models of people think about thinking is, oh, we look at an image and we know what it is. But it's not like that at all. Your eyes are constantly moving and the input's constantly changing. When you pick up something like an object, like this coffee cup, my fingers are moving over it and the inputs are changing. And so it's been known for a long time that the brain has to t- incorporate movement with the sensory data, but no one really had any idea how to do that. And so I think that's the, perhaps the biggest contribution we're making here is that we have a very cohesive theory that explains exactly how that's occurring and how movement is part of the model building process, a part of understanding. And I think that's a big part of it. And then, and then for this idea that we talked about earlier about the cortical column, in some ways, that's been the holy grail. Like, what could it be? What could cortical column be? What could the common algorithm be? And, and no one had really any good ideas about it. And at least we have a, We now have a very good idea. We'll see if it's right. I'm pretty sure it is, but we'll see. We have a, now a very comprehensive idea. It's a sensory motor learning system based on reference frames and movement, and we can explain how it works. And I think that's been an answer to a puzzle that's been, been bothering people for a long time. And, and, that, and as I said earlier, also the idea that we've now thoroughly incorporated movement into the the whole brain mechanism. And uh, that hasn't really, people have known that had to happen, but they didn't know how to do it before. And and you automatically solved the binding problem. Yes. I I didn't know if you want me to go there or not. Yeah, you go there. (laughs) uh, Yeah, okay. So there's a thing called the binding problem, which it's poorly defined because people interpret it differently. But you can think of it as, as, as the following. The brain has all these different sensors. Your eye 
it's really, your retina is really not one sensor. It's thousands of sensors aligned to each other. It's just like your skin is thousands of tens of thousands of sensors along your skin. And your ear has the cochlea and it's thousands, tens of thousands of individual sensors in there. And so you have all this information streaming into the brain. They all have to be processed separately. And so it's all the stuff going on, but we have this singular perception of the world. We don't have a feeling that, oh, I'm hearing one thing and I'm seeing something. I'm not aware of all this complicated stuff going on in your head. And you just look out in the world and you say, there it is. I'm looking at something and I know what it is. I know what it's supposed to feel like. I know what it's supposed to look like. I know what it's supposed to sound like. And so the question is, was, where does all this information get, get brought together in the brain? So where does it get bound together into sort of our singular percept? And if you look at the, the brain, you don't see that. You don't see everything going into one spot, which is like, that's you. You, know? <laughs> you see connections going all over the place. There's no, doesn't seem to be any centralized anything. Well, how could that be? And our theory, which I should I'd be remiss not to mention, we call this the thousand brains theory to reflect the fact that you've got these tens of thousands of models in your neocortex. Your the thousand brains theory says, you have all these independent models or each modeling a part of the world that they can see. And they don't actually come together, but what they do, and we haven't talked about this yet, is that they vote. So most of these long range connections in the neocortex that go from all over the place, from one side, the other, up and down, all over the place, there's, there's this everywhere. You see these long range connections connecting parts of the neocortex together. We believe they're voting. They're the different columns saying like, I'm a touch column, I'm representing the, the, my finger the, and fingers input. And I think I'm touching a coffee cup. But I'm not certain about it. And another, the visual column says, well, I'm looking at a little edge in the scene out here. But I'm trying to model it, but I'm not sure. It could be a coffee cup or it could be a chair. And all these columns are not really certain what they're looking at, but they have information. But they can vote through these long-range connections. They literally try to reach a common consensus, which is consistent with what they're all experiencing. This makes it so that all of a sudden everyone goes, yep, I know what I'm, we're all agreeing. This is a coffee cup. We're all agreeing this is a computer. We're all agreeing this is a bird. And so the binding doesn't occur in one spot. It's essentially a voting mechanism that occurs across the brain. And our perceptions are primarily of that voting. We're not aware of all the thousands of models that are guessing what's going on in the world, but we are aware of their consensus. And the consensus is, yes, we all agree that this is something. And I can drill down and say, what does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? But we all agree it's this bird or whatever. And so it solves the binding problem by not binding it into one spot, by, but by voting and reaching consensus. And therefore, we don't have to look for a spot in the brain where everything comes together. We don't have that. It also makes sense of the discovery that most of what the cortex does is not conscious. Yes, we're, we're totally unaware of almost everything that's going on up there. <laughs> uh, you're not even aware that your eyes are moving most of the time. I'm sure you know this, but just remind your, your listeners that your eyes are moving three times a second. And if you're just looking at something, you're not aware they're moving at all. Yet the inputs to the brain are changing completely. It's not shifting around. It's a completely new input three times a second. And yet you're not aware of that. And so the neurons are flailing about all over the place, changing this and changing that, but the voting is the same. So I walk through examples of this in the book. I, I, I give sort of the high level examples of analogies to this, but all this activity and chatter is going on. Everything's changing all the time, but the, the, the consensus vote is not changing. So I might be looking at a bird and my eyes are moving and all these things, the inputs are changing constantly, but the consensus says, nope, there's a bird at that location and there are neurons that are not changing. Those are the voting neurons. They're the ones that are saying, yep, we all agree, it's still a bird. And you're only aware of that. You're not aware of all the other stuff that's going on. So this is surprising. It's really interesting, actually. I want to take a moment to mention the second edition of my book, are You Sure? The Unconscious Origins of Certainty, which I released in June of 2020. You can buy it from your favorite online bookseller in paperback or ebook format. But if you'd like to buy an autographed copy, just email me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. You can get it for only $25, including postage, if you live in the continental United States. Jeff, what do you think at this point are the key unanswered questions? I think if you think about the brain overall, that's a very big question. I'd rather just focus on the ones that I'm trying to solve right, right now. Right, that's what I meant. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, Your key unanswered questions? Yeah, I, in fact, I'm, I'm really excited because I think just 
in the last few months, I've made some significant problem on one of these questions. We got, we, we, you briefly mentioned earlier this issue that reference frames, are they relative to the object you're viewing or relative to your body? And I said, well, there's reference frames relative to the objects. And I also mentioned there's reference frames relative to your body. So the movement of my eyes is relative to my head. And the movement of my fingers is relative to my hand and my body. And so what we say, there's a, there's a need for doing what's called a reference frame transformation. I have to be able to convert information from, well, if I'm bending my finger, which is moving it relative to my body, how is that moving relative to an object I'm touching, such as my coffee cup? It depends on the orientation of the coffee cup. If the coffee cup is tilted one way or tilted the other way, the same movement of my finger results in a different movement relative to the coffee cup. So if I, if the coffee cup is on its side, I'm moving my finger down, we move it along the edge of the, the side of the coffee cup. But if the coffee cup was vertical, moving it would move from the top lip to the bottom lip, something like that. Anyway, so there's a need for reference frame transformations to go between these different reference frames. I believe this happens everywhere. That is, every cortical column has to do reference frame transformations. Every cortical column has to say, I'm getting my input from someplace, but that input is in one reference frame, but I need to model something in a different reference frame. And so how, does, how do the neurons do that? And I'm onto it. I would give this, I'm very excited about it now, but we'll have to see if it, it plays out. I believe that this is occurring in the thalamus. And some of your listeners may know that the thalamus, it's a, a smaller structure in the middle of your brain, but it's intimately connected to the neocortex. That is every part of the neocortex projects to the thalamus and the thalamus projects back to the neocortex. It's just part of the neocortex. It's just relocated someplace. And it's been a mystery what the, neuro, what the thalamus does. Uh, sometimes it's called a relay center. There's a lot that's known about its anatomy and its physiology, but very little is known about what it does. Starting a couple of years ago, we had a project to figure out what can we deduce about the function of the thalamus. And one of the things we, we came up with, we said, it looks like it, it could be doing something that's called a multiplexer, which is an engineering term. It's just a way of routing signals. You can take a bunch of signals and say, well, they're coming out of these wires and we're gonna switch them over to come out on those wires. And so uh, I've been working on a theory that the thalamus is actually doing this reference frame transform, and that's why it's so critical. Every part of the brain, every part of the neocortex has to do this. And a lot of things have come into place for that. So that's one of the things I'm working on. I think another big unanswered question is really understanding something you brought up earlier, which is what's the true nature of the hierarchical connections? You know, what happens when information is being transported from one region to another region to another region? Our new theory, the thousand brain theory, says each region on its own is able to build the complete models of the world. So what exactly are they passing to the next region? And how does that next region work with that? There's a lot of complexities in that that we don't understand yet. In some sense, I feel like I understand the hierarchy less than I used to understand it. And I want to, I'd like to get to the bottom of that. So those are two things that, that we're working on. I read the 2019 paper that you reference in the book, and you mentioned that, yeah, we found the grid cells, at least in the frontal lobe. We didn't find them. Other people found them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm using the generic we yeah, as in, yeah, yeah. Um, but there's, there's got to be something you call a displacement cell, which I assume is an, an analog to the place cells in not, the Not the really. Group. It's the second piece of the puzzle. Grid cells alone are not enough. Yeah, that's right. We deduced purely deduction, a, a need for a different type of representation and therefore a different type of cell that we just call displacement cells. And it represents the relative position of two things or the relative location of two things. You can think about it, the displacement, how far away is my table from my door type of thing. It's, it's a very rough analogy. And we deduced the need for this. We wrote about this in our 2019 paper. We talked about its attributes, what it would do, why we need it, how they would interact with other cells. But we have no empirical evidence for it yet. I'm not sure we've even looked yet. I, I, it's almost certain there's something like that there. I'm very confident. It's just, it's not like anyone was looking for these things. <laughs> it's, there are many cells in the brain and the cortex in particular. When researchers record from cells, they have no idea what they're doing. And so when people report the cells are doing something in the cortex, they're, they're only reporting a subset of the cells that they can actually try to identify as doing some function. <laughs> but usually well over half the cells are just unknown what they do. So there's lots of cells in there that can be doing this. Another thing I'm working on right now, I didn't tell you this, another thing I'm working on is I have a new theory of what mini columns are doing as part of this thousand brains theory. So thousand brains theory, by the way, opens up a whole new way of thinking about a lot of different things like the thalamus and now mini columns. Just to remember, mini columns are these very, cells in the neocortex are aligned in these very skinny little strings. 
about 120 cells each. And there's maybe 150 million of these. This is how the neocortex evolves. So these are what's called the mini commons, these very thin little structures that contain cells 120 at a time right next to each other. And there's been a long debate about what they do. Do they do anything? Why are they there? And so there's a lot of evidence that they do something, but no one knows what it is. Uh, but we, uh, we have a theory about that now. And that hasn't been published. By the way, I think, by, excuse me, I, I want to get into the displacement cells should be part of the mini column. So that's why I want to get in there. That's how we got there. <laughs> how would you design an experiment to falsify your theory? We talked about that both in our papers a lot. There's, there's lots of ways you could falsify it. Well, there's a lot of predictions that we make that could turn out to be wrong. First of all, one of our strongest predictions was, was that we'd find grid cells in the neocortex. That was one of our strongest predictions. And at least for some parts of the neocortex, that's been found already. So now I have to find some other things that, you know, this, remember we talked about this voting between the neurons, between the columns. That says that these long range connections are voting connections. And therefore they should have stable representations. That is, if I look at which cells are active, they should be stable as long as I'm looking at the same object or I'm touching the same object. And as far as you know, no one's ever tested that hypothesis or, or measured that. What makes a good prediction is it's, it would have a surprising answer, <laughs> okay? So that's a surprising answer that you would look at these cells and we predict, we can even tell you where they are in the cortex, which ones to look at. And what we'd expect you to see is that you'd see a sparse activation, I mean, most of them wouldn't be active, but a few of them would be active. And the few that would be active would be stable while the other cells in the cortical column are changing. And so that's, a, that's another type of, we have a lot of predictions like that, that the good predictions, again, are ones that are, that have a surprising answer to them. Like you wouldn't have expected this to happen. And of course we can only falsify a theory. You can never prove a theory. You can always say, well, we've tried falsifying this way and we've tried falsifying that way, <laughs> but you can never like prove it. That's just one of the dictums of science. Um, so there's a lot of ways you could disprove the theory. That's the whole thing about Einstein's theory of relativity is he predicted a bunch of stuff that was really weird. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and in his case, people couldn't, some of those, you know, it took decades and decades for people to actually prove it. Fortunately, I don't think we have to wait that long. In our world, <laughs> things move much more quickly in the neuroscience world. Jeff, you sort of alluded to this, but could you talk a little bit about an understanding that we can't prove the theory, but let's go from the assumption that it's essentially true. What would be the implications of that? We haven't mentioned, but in my book, I actually have three sections in the book. <laughs> the first section is all about the neuroscience. And then there's a section about AI, artificial intelligence. And there's a section that's more broadly about humanity. So I think the theory has implications in all these areas. I, I search in terms of neuroscience, there are tens of thousands of neuroscientists who want to understand how the human brain makes us intelligent. And I think this provides a really a very a missing framework to understand what the whole picture is about. And so to me, this the one of the advantages of this theory is it, it does produce a lot of testable hypotheses and, and a sort of a a cohesive theoretical framework for saying, oh, now we understand what intelligence is. Now we understand what's going on when we see things and when we learn and how we learn the structure of the world and so on. So that's a pure scientific interest. Like, how does the brain work? It might have some, some relevance to certain brain-related diseases, but that's not my focus and I, I don't make that claim yet. But then I think from a practical point of view in other aspects of our lives as humans, it's going to have a huge impact on artificial intelligence because it explains what it is to be intelligent. And our current AI systems aren't like that at all. And so I, I have a whole section of the book about walking through the implications in AI and the dangers of AI or not dangers of AI and how to think about AI and how it's going to impact society based on our neuroscience discoveries. And then the final part of the book is a bit more philosophical, but I talk about the human condition and if we understand what it means to be intelligent, if we understand that we have this model of the world in our head and we understand how that model is learned. And this is how we perceive the world. We perceive the world as part of this model. We actually, when we look out and look at the world, we're perceiving our model, not the actual world, surprising as it is. I'm not the first person to say that. So <laughs> a lot of people have made that argument, but we now understand how that model can be false and under what conditions does it become false? And can it misrepresent the actual world? And you think you understand the world, but you don't, you actually got something wrong. So that leads to false beliefs. And so I think humans are very susceptible to false beliefs. 
And I was writing this long before there was the latest, all these conspiracy theories and so on, but we are susceptible to false beliefs. And this is a real risk to us as, as humans. If we want to survive a long period of time, how do we get over these risks? And what are the challenges we face associated with the, our intelligence brings with it existential risks for humanity. So it's a, it's a kind of a double-edged sword, I guess. So I talk about that in the third part of the book. So I, you know, and then I, I can't, I, I, won't, I don't want to end this interview about getting this one last little thing in about it, but I end the book with a sort of call to action. I think to me, when our kids grow up, we expect them to learn about the solar system. The earth revolves around the sun and we expect them to learn about DNA. Like, okay, DNA, this, you know, these molecules and encode our genes and our traits, and this is how you know, humans are defined. I think we all ought to learn about brain science. We all ought to learn about the theory about what's going on in our head as we look out at the part of the world and we learn the world, we learn this model of the world and how our world model can be false. To me, this is like basic knowledge that we should all have just like basic knowledge about DNA or about the solar system and the universe. And I think when we finally have a very cohesive theory, which we're very close to here, I think we've made a lot of progress, that should be taught to every kid in high school. And if we all understood how we can make false beliefs and how, we, and how we could be biased in what we understand about the world, I think it would make our future a bit rosier. Well, I certainly agree with you about that. I mean, the belief that understanding neuroscience is going to be a basic skill for being a citizen in the future drives this show. That's a good way of putting it. I like that. <laughs> just if people understood how easy it is to get false memories, that's one that just could have huge impacts. Jeff, what else would you like to share before we close? To me, understanding, and, and you probably agree with this, Ginger, but understanding how the brain works, to me, is the most important intellectual scientific endeavor of all time. Humans are essentially unique because of our intelligence and our brains, and everything we've ever done is based on our brains. Every accomplishment of any sort is about brains. And we can't even understand we have to, we want to understand ourselves. If we understand what we're doing, if we understand the universe, we, we understand what it means to understand something. We have to understand how the brain works. To me, it's like everybody should be concerned about this. Everyone should be at least curious and want to know who they are and how they behave and how humans are doing the things we do. And so part of my job, I think just what you, part of what you're doing, Ginger, as you said, is bringing this to more and more people. I wrote this book not because I want to write a book. It's a lot of work. <laughs> and I don't really care about selling books to make money at all. There's nothing about that at all. But I think that the messages in the book are important. And I felt an obligation to put them in a forum that people could read and engage with and get them to think about it. And I achieved that to some extent with my first book on intelligence. And I'm hoping I'm going to achieve that even more with this book, A Thousand Brains, A New Theory of Intelligence. Yeah, I think it definitely brings the conversation to the next level. So, Jeff, how has your advice for students changed over the last, say, five to 10 years? Because I'm sure you're used to being asked that question, but I'm sure that your opinions have changed. How have they changed? In terms of if someone comes to me and says, I want to work in this field? Well, it has changed and it hasn't changed. What has changed is I can point to someone says, you know, someone reads will read this book and say, I want to work on this. I say, great. I think that's wonderful. And I'm sure I'll get those, that question. They'll say, how do I go about it? And, I, and now today is I can point to various research groups or different universities. And I can say, you know, they have a theoretical group over here. Or these people have a theoretical group over here. Or this particular scientist has, is, is doing something like you want to do. And, and you should contact them and see if you can work for them. That's changed because 20, 30 years ago, I would, I could be very difficult for me to point to anybody. <laughs> you can say, you want to work on theoretical neuroscience here? It wasn't any place I could point to, but that's changed. What hasn't changed is that there is still a huge resistance to, I, I'm not thinking resistance is the right word. It's, it's almost like apathy to strong theorists in neuroscience. And so what happens to young people is they go work in some scientific lab. And what often occurs is they get assigned to do data analysis on someone's experiments or something like that. And there still isn't a really robust community of theoretical neuroscientists as you would find in some other scientific fields. So there's places you can have theoretical neuroscience groups and there's places that, you know, you can sort of work on the t problems, but it's still difficult to, to really get grants and, and to focus on the kind of work that we do, pure theory, or it's not pure theory, but it's theory that's merged with uh, uh, empirical evidence. Well, maybe it's partly due to the fact that neuroscience is a very young field relative to physics. 
Maybe. At least part of it. I know there's a lot of other factors. <laughs> yeah. I think another thing it might have been is that that for so long, there hadn't really been much theoretical progress. And so people got into their mind that, well, it's just not possible. <laughs> so don't even try it. <laughs> it's like you're a fool. You're just going to waste your time. I don't know. It's interesting. That would be a, as someone should do this sort of a historical perspective about the history of neuroscience and you know, some 50 years from now, they'll write, look back and say, well, what happened? Why was it like that? <laughs> yeah. Well, last year I interviewed a friend of mine in, in, that I've interviewed actually several times over the year, Matthew Cobb, who is a guy in the UK who studies smell, I think, in flies or something like that. But he um, has written several really good sort of science history type books. And his most recent book that he published last year was called The Idea of the Brain. And you might, it's a really nice book. He really shows how whatever our sort of current model that we're, or metaphor influences us. I think I listened, you, you had a podcast about that, yeah. right? So and of course, that computer that. metaphor is a, it's just such a incomplete metaphor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not right. And, and that's why the, the top line is that brain is not a computer. The brain is a modeling system and it learns to model the world. And that's what makes us intelligent. It's not how we process the information. It's how we yeah. build them out of the world. Well, it's been great talking to you again. I've, I'm looking forward to seeing what comes next and sharing your book with my listeners. It's a great follow-up on the first book, and I'm going to encourage everybody to read it. Thank you very much. Well, I, I tell people to listen to your podcast, too. So Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's a great way of keeping in touch. Um, all right. Well, it's great talking to you again, Ginger, as always, and I appreciate you're taking the time and the effort you put into this and you're building an interest in talking to me about it. It was great fun to talk with Jeff Hawkins again because his passion is contagious. His new book, A Thousand Brains, A New Theory of Intelligence, makes the work of his team accessible to readers of all backgrounds. I'm going to summarize our conversation, but I highly recommend that you read this book yourself. In On Intelligence, Hawkins emphasized the idea that prediction is a key feature of cortical function and intelligence. This idea has become fairly mainstream, but now he's tackling the bigger question of how the cortex accomplishes this task. Many researchers have assumed that somehow the cortex creates a model of both the body and the external world, but Hawkins has tackled the question of how these models are actually generated by real neurons and their connections. I refer you back to episode 139 when we talked in more detail about how neurons differ from the artificial neurons that appear in the so-called neural nets of artificial intelligence. But I will mention that much of what real neurons do is actually analog, despite the use of action potentials, which are the all-or-nothing spikes that are used to transmit signals between neurons. Hawkins loves to use our perception of a coffee cup as a simple illustration of how our brain models the world. This idea also appeared in episode 139, but there are a couple of new ideas that he shared with us today. One is the idea that the cortical columns, first identified by Vernon Montcastle, appear to be the primary functional unit of the cortex. That's why he calls his theory a thousand brains, because he estimates that there are 150,000 cortical columns, and he proposes that each column is generating its own model and that these compete to create the world we experience. What would be required for a cortical column to create a model? Well, it needs inputs and it needs to know how the inputs relate to one another. This is where the idea of reference frames comes in. Experiments with rats have shown that the combination of grid cells and place cells in their hippocampus allow them to know where they are in a room, as well as where objects are relative to their body, or more specifically their heads. Since the hippocampus is a very ancient brain structure, Hawkins argues that the use of what he calls reference frames is very old from an evolutionary standpoint. A key theoretical leap described in 
a thousand brains, is that modeling the world would require a reference frame that is relative to the, an external location. For example, where is the handle of the coffee cup relative to the cup as a whole? An example Hawkins used was modeling a room with objects described in terms of their position in the room, not relative to the person entering the room. But determining body position in the world and modeling external objects requires movement. Our eyes are constantly moving as we perceive the world around us. Now, the idea that movement is critical is not new, but Hawkins incorporates it with two other key discoveries. First, the idea that the, each cortical column creates its own model, and second, that the key to how these models work is reference frames, which is like having an XYZ coordinate system to describe the location. How does this affect our hierarchical model of how the brain works? Instead of putting raw data in the bottom and having a final output or model, Hawkins argues that complete models are being built at every level. This seems like a strange claim, but he says it is supported by empiric evidence. Each level is passing on a complete model, not a particular feature as is traditionally assumed. One piece of evidence he shared was that the mouse has decent vision, even though its visual system lacks the complex hierarchy that we see in primates. But he also suggested that the hierarchy is probably important to having a deeper understanding of the world. Hawkins emphasized that his theory is not anti-hierarchical, but rather adds the importance of behavior and the role of constantly changing inputs. The importance of a movement has been acknowledged for years, but this theory explains what might be happening. It also solves the binding problem because there's no need to figure out where everything comes together. Hawkins calls this the thousand brains theory, theory to capture the fact that the cortex is creating tens of thousands of models. They don't come together, but via long-range connections, they vote and create a consensus about what is being perceived. For example, his coffee cup. We perceive whatever gets the most votes. This also makes sense of the paradox that most of what the cortex does is unconscious. For example, we are not aware of our eyes' constant motion. Now, you might argue that this sounds esoteric, but the key idea is that it generates testable hypotheses. It generates testable predictions. So far, some of the predictions have held up to review of the existing data, while others are awaiting further exploration. Hawkins made another important point that I think bears emphasizing. He said, we can only falsify theory. You can never prove a theory. So what are the key unanswered questions? One is, well, how are these reference frames relative to objects actually realized in the brain? He thinks it might involve the thalamus, but we don't know the answer to this yet. Another question is, what is the true nature of the brain's hierarchical connections? What is being passed from one level to the next? A key theoretical prediction of this theory is the existence of what he calls displacement cells that would represent the relative position between two things. This is described in the 2019 paper that I will link to in the show notes. Hawkins said that so far no one's really looked for displacement cells, but we do know that half the cells in the cortex at the present time, we don't know what they're doing. You know, when you read a paper, they tell you about the readings they got that had known correlation, but if you actually look at the numbers, you realize that usually it is about half the cells that they have thrown away because they don't have any known correlation. And I'm going to talk some more about this idea in an upcoming episode. So what are the implications of the thousand brain theory? For neuroscience, Hawkins is hoping that this will create a possibility of a cohesive theoretical framework 
that will generate testable hypotheses. It also has implications for artificial intelligence because Hawkins argues that it explains why current AI systems are not truly intelligent. And there's a real deep discussion of this in the book, including the question of whether or not AI is actually dangerous. Finally, in terms of the implications for humanity, what does it mean to be intelligent? We perceive a model of the world, not the actual world, and our model is learned, which means we can have false beliefs. In fact, humans are very prone to false beliefs, and Hawkins argues this represents an existential risk. He commented that children should be learning about the brain, just like they learn about the solar system and DNA. Finally, he says, the brain is not a computer. The brain is a modeling system in order to model the world. And what makes us intelligent is not how we process information. It's how we model the world. This is a critical concept, not only because our models can be wrong, but because a lot of human conflict appears to be rooted in our conflicting models. Jeff Hawkins' new book, A Thousand Brains, A New Theory of Intelligence, is highly accessible to readers of all backgrounds, and I highly recommend it for anyone who's curious about what the brain really does. All the technical papers that describe Numenta's work are freely available, and I will include links to these at brainsciencepodcast.com. I'd love to hear your feedback about this episode and the show in general. You can write to me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget, you can get complete show notes and episode transcripts at brainsciencepodcast.com. You can also sign up for our free newsletter so that you can get show notes automatically. To get the newsletter, just text Brain Science, all one word, to 55444. That's Brain Science, all one word, to 55444. I also hope you'll check out my book, Are You Sure? The Unconscious Origins of Certainty. And if you want to support the show, please go to brainsciencepodcast.com forward slash donations. Finally, I want to take a moment to talk about the website. I recently added a search bar at the top of every page, but I realized that it's become increasingly difficult to find what you're looking for because there's nearly 15 years of content. I'm in the preliminary stages of redesigning the website, and I need your help. If you have thoughts or suggestions, please write to me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. I'm also looking for a few volunteers who are interested in becoming more involved in this project. Just email me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. Next month, I'll be talking with Mark Solms about his new book, The Hidden Spring, A Journey to the Source of Consciousness. Solms worked closely with the late Jacques Pancep, and he argues that a viable theory of consciousness must incorporate the ancient origins of emotion. I know you won't want to miss this episode, so be sure to sign up for the newsletter, either at the website or by texting Brain Science to 55. Four, four, four. You can also subscribe or follow Brain Science in your favorite audio app. Thanks again for listening. I look forward to talking with you again very soon. Brain Science is copyright 2021 to Virginia Campbell, MD. You may copy it to share it with others, but for any other uses or derivatives, please contact me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. The theme music for Brain Science is Mindfire, written and performed by Tony Catraccia. You can find his work at syncopationnow.com.